Welcome to the Airspace Advantage Podcast. I'm Doug Berkey, filling in for Slick. You know, last week we heard from a legendary set of air commanders who designed and executed the Operation Enduring Freedom Air Campaign in response to the attacks of 9-11. And just to be clear, the first-person recollections you're hearing are incredibly unique and insightful. In fact, you know, we talked about it as a group after recording, and I think this is the first time all of these individuals have been gathered around together to, to talk about these experiences since they really happened. So it's quite historic to, to hear these, these voices together. The challenges these individuals faced were tremendous. I mean, designing an air campaign less than a month in a place where nobody expected it, that is an incredibly tough order. And using old Soviet maps and stretching airmen and aircraft to the limits, I mean, they got the job done, but wow, was it tough. And let's face it, the first phase of OEF was a tremendous success. It happened faster than anybody imagined. And so I think what these individuals did, the plan they came up with and all, we cannot salute them enough for those efforts. It, it was truly amazing. And as a refresher as to, you know, who was in what job at the time, let's, let's just go over the basics. You've got General Mosley and General Wald. They each served as the head of Central Command Air Forces, commander, back-to-back assignments. General Deptula commanded the Combined Air Operations Center. And General Stutzream was the director of operations for Joint Task Force Southwest Asia. And he was deputy director of the Combined Air Operations Center. So with that, let's reenter the conversation. So General Deptula, you know, You've made it a point over the years to emphasize that we've got to ensure that sensor-to-shooter time-sensitive targeting timelines measured in minutes, you know, and that's really how we operate today, that, are, that they're not limited by longer decision cycle timelines in that in excessive, you know, oversubscribed vetting cycle that, that could really negate our technological advantage here. So could you give us an example of, of why you're so vested in this perspective? Sure, Doug. I'd be happy to do so. And um, as you mentioned, I think the best way to do that is through a real-world example that I'll relay for you now. The night prior to the first major Northern Alliance assault on the Taliban uh, in the town of Masri Sharif, which is a place up in the uh, northwest uh, corner of Afghanistan, um, I received a message in the CAOC uh, from General Dostum. Now, General Dosim was one of the Northern Alliance senior commanders, and in this message, he told us that he'd just gotten off the phone with the senior Taliban commander in the region who was using Dostrum's house in Shabergan, which is a small town about 50 kilometers west of Majuri Sharif, and he was using his house as the Taliban command center. So what Dostum asked us to do was to bomb his house immediately. Now, some might ask, well, why would you bomb your house? But you got to understand that, um, you know, that that he knew he'd be taken care of. uh, And uh, the the key issue here was to get rid of the Taliban leadership. And he told us that it would be easy to find as it was the only house in the town that had a swimming pool and a tennis court. So I turned to my chief of intelligence, Navy Captain Frank, and we used to call him Barney, and uh, asked him uh, if he'd go get a photo of the area, of the town of, uh, of Shebergen. He comes back with a photo that a blind man could find this house. Uh, we took a look at it and uh, figured that, that we did a little weaponeering right there and figured the two 2,000-pound JDAMs would do the job. So I look up on the attack flow plan and see that there's going to be a B-1 in the area in about an hour. So I call Stutz, who's my chief of combat ops, and I tell him to reroute the B-1 and pass to it the new targeting coordinates for at least two of their weapons. But remember those rules of engagement. They required me to get approval to hit any new target from CENTCOM. So I pick up the phone and I call the CENTCOM J3 shop and I tell them what's going on and what our plan is to hit the location. And the response was, yeah, we saw the request too um, and we've got the picture, but hold on as we need to make sure that we're not being fooled and that that's the right location. So in the interest of time, let me summarize what happened next. CENTCOM down at Tampa, faxes a picture of the target to the special operations folks who are operating out of Karshi Kanabab up in Tajikistan. 
and has them helicopter it over to the special ops folks who are in the area. And then they take it on horseback to show General Dostum and they ask him if that's the right target. Now, his response was, yeah, that's it. And you can bomb it if you want. Uh, but now there's nobody there. Now, the reason no one's there is this took three days. I'm not making this up. I couldn't make this up. This really happened. So the lesson here is that we must ensure that sensor-to-shooter time-sensitive targeting timelines that we can respond to in minutes are not limited by these longer decision cycle timelines. Uh, because once again, as you mentioned up front, uh, this kind of excessive, ultimately ridiculous uh, vetting cycle negates our technological advantage. And this happened again in Operation Inherent Resolve. Sometimes it would take folks in the CAOC 47 days to fully vet a target. Uh, to wit, I respond to them, you do know that the entire Operation Desert Storm only took 43 days. Anyway, uh, it, this was one of the frustrations that we had to deal with. And you can't make that stuff up. Hey, Stutz, you know, as I recall, just, you know, from the stories you shared over the years, wasn't there a time also with rules of engagement where you actually clearly saw the Taliban retreating and, and you weren't even authorized to strike them? Oh, we had many cases. Uh, remember that later in the war, especially when General Mosley uh, arrived, it was a very fluid environment. We were looking, searching, finding targets of opportunity, and developing what we called at that time time-sensitive targeting. And uh, that was being able to, as quickly as possible, as General Deptula, you know, infers, as quickly as possible, make that decision, have everything marshaled, ready to go, so that fleeting target can be be attacked. And it was always uh, uh, delayed because of, of uh, approvals that in ROE that were we had to, to live with. So uh, there were a number of times uh, when we had large numbers of Taliban that were t- detected. Uh, General Dipula can tell some stories about when we brought in some major big weapons and uh, everybody got involved in uh, where that weapon was going to be placed such that when that bomb detonated, uh, it had no effect. And so uh, I, I, I want to just go back to, to the predator revolution, you know, this, this whole predator revolution that was beginning at that time. It was, it was brilliant, but it was very frustrating in terms of the ability to see through a soda straw this, uh, you know, this image of what was going on in uh, Afghanistan, and and shortly everybody had somehow connected to the predator feed, and and me running combat operations from the floor, uh, executing the directions of the bosses here, uh, I was getting calls from everywhere on the planet about, you know, hey, did you see that shadow on the predator feed? And and, uh, some of those calls were coming from Tampa, some were coming from the Pentagon. So there was this period of time that allowed folks to reach into our operation and even constrain it beyond the rules of engagement and the approval processes that were set in motion. And it took a long time for that to be resolved. And and, and today, I think uh, if we were to go to war with China, we're still going to have that dynamic of folks wanting to control at the tactical level or at the operational level what is best left to the warfighters at that level, especially the airmen, uh, the air and space power that's being applied. I appreciate that. So, General Mosley, could you just kind of bring us up to speed how you saw the campaign unfold here as, as the days are passing? I mean, what effects are you trying to net, and how did you see the, the change evolve given CENTCOM's micromanagement of, of the air ops? Well, I think let, let's go back to the unmanned systems for a little bit because there's a couple of other, I think, uh, really important lessons learned. I, I was blessed or cursed, I'm not sure which, to be the first wing commander ever to get these things when I commanded the 57th wing at Mellis. Joe Fogelman called one day out of the blue. You don't normally get a call from the chief and said, effectively, I'm giving you these UAVs. Uh, and I said, boss, what do you want me to do with them? He goes, we don't know. I don't know. Figure it out. Uh, see what you think. So 
in the middle of everything else at Nellis, I got the, the UAV stuff and we started. And that was in the late spring of 96. And that summer, we deployed them into the Balkans for the first mission when the Pope visited the Balkans. Uh, and, and those guys have never come back. There's multiple squadrons now, but not once since the late spring of 96 have the UAV squadrons all been home. Both uh, the, the unarmed predators, and remember the, the, the initial predator could, could uh, normally cruise at about 65 knots, but you could dash it out to 75 knots. They had two kinds of engines, one with a carburetor and one with a fuel injector. Uh, they didn't have very good icing. We lost a bunch of them in ice. Uh, we put the pylons and the missiles on them, and for every pylon and missile, you lose eight hours, uh, or you lose four hours on station. And then you had the, the links, you know, the KU band link, satellite link back to different places, and Stutz is right. I mean, I think probably everybody in Washington, to include the State Department and everyone else, had a TV monitor watching predator feeds. I can remember Stutz was in on this conversation with the A-4 guy named Dwayne Jones and the deputy, uh, Admiral Dave Nichols. I asked the, the UAV guys, where did these feeds go when they leave uh, our headquarters or our AOR? The answer was they go through a central kind of a staging node in Sigonella, and then from Sigonella they get shot across the Atlantic into Washington and everywhere else. And I remember asking, how often do we have to do maintenance on that node? And the answer was, well, we have to do it every once in a while. And I said, and when we do maintenance on that node, do we take the feed down from Sigonella forward? And they said, we can. I said, okay, how about tonight you start maintenance on that feed and you clip that uh, UAV feed from Sigonella forward? And the look, Stutz will remember this, the look around the table was, you're, you know, you're just the CFAC. You're going to stop the predator feeds to all of Washington and all of the headquarters and everybody on their desk is going to get nothing. I said, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And we did. Uh, in the next iteration of my life, when I'm in Washington, one of the first things Secretary Rumsfeld asked me was, aren't you the guy that cut the predator feeds to Washington? I said, yes, sir, I am. And he goes, well, that was smart. Uh, now, I don't know that that's written anywhere in a CFAC handbook, but I didn't figure I needed 2,000 people watching predator feeds and offering help. So, Doug, to your question, I, I think we've already talked about how this morphed into kind of a national takedown into a hunt. Uh, and then the interface with the Army. And, and if you, you have to think back, in February late January, February, March of 02, we were all talking with General Franks about getting out of this place because we'd accomplished the mission. From General Wall's time and then into my time, the mission was accomplished. Taliban had been removed. We, we bloodied them pretty bad. The Al-Qaeda guys, every time they'd pop their head up, we'd kill them. And so the question that I was asking and others were, how long do we stay here to do this? And the consensus was, let's get our stuff out of here. Now, that was in early spring 02. But then it began to morph into a variety of land component things. And then we morphed into nation building and we morphed into other things. And the nature of OEF from the beginning completely changed. Uh, and it became uh, a holding force, actually, as we spun up from June of 02 into March of 03 for Iraq. Afghanistan kind of became a holding action as we focused more on Iraq. And in fact, we built three KOX, the one at PSAB and then two others, and we ran Afghanistan out of one and Iraq out of the other. And we, we tried to segregate that uh, as far as the conflict of personnel and et cetera. So Doug, I, th I think that probably answers your question. We go from a national takedown and a collapse of a regime into hunting individuals into some kind of sustained army nation building thing that continued up until a month ago. Now, sir, I appreciate that. And, and General Deptil, I just want to bring you in here. You know, you've written a lot about this whole notion of, of how the, the mission um, expanded in, in, like General Mosley just said, lasted decades. You want to weigh in here? Yeah. Um, 
there, there's so much to take away from this. But what I would tell you in summary is neutering al-Qaeda and eliminating Afghanistan as an al-Qaeda sanctuary were truly critical U.S. national security objectives. But attempting to turn Afghanistan into a modern Jeffersonian democracy was not. Now, what Joe Mosley was just talking about um, the, the kinds of concerns in the context of he and others had realized that. Now, critics might insist that early 2002 was too soon to recognize that al-Qaeda in Afghanistan was indeed neutered. But when we shifted from a strategy of counterterrorism to one of counterinsurgency, we shifted from a set of strategic objectives that were vital to the United States to a new set of objectives that were not. Um, after large numbers of U.S. and coalition ground forces got in place, they found out that the Taliban were out of power. Um, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan were gone, and a friendly government was in power. So they looked for a mission, and it became winning hearts and minds. Now, this, this shift occurred gradually and without a lot of fanfare, except for the publicly celebrated surges of additional ground forces, but it resulted in a serious case of mission creep. We evolved from a mission of unquestionable security rationale into one that was not ours to solve, uh, namely the transfiguration of the tribal peoples of Afghanistan into citizens of a modern nation state. And I'd tell you that this mission creep won't be easy to admit but it's really necessary to recognize if we're to avoid similar outcomes in the future. And it also highlights the failure of the ground-centric nation-building via land occupation strategy that was embraced by U.S. Central Command and by a U.S. joint staff that was dominated by land warfare officers who did not learn or relearn the lessons of Vietnam. And that was the principal reason for the massive occupation effort. I appreciate you pointing that out. And I just want to circle back to something General Mosley is talking about, and, and that really is you gentlemen employed Predator and Global Hawk as, as the first air commanders to do so in a large-scale fashion. And can you talk about what a game changer it really was and any particular missions that stand out? Yeah, Doug, let me, let me tackle that. I think, I, I think for the Global Hawk, let's go, let's go to that one first. When, we, when I asked for Global Hawk's, uh, of General Jumper, that we had three in the Air Force that could fly. Northrop hadn't delivered uh, any more than that, and these three were Beale and Ed Edwards. So he said, sure. So he gave us one, uh, and when we uh, brought it into Al Dafra, it refused to land. It kept going around because it couldn't figure out the uh, runway heading. After about three or four go rounds, we finally got it down on the ground. It, it, it was in, at night. It had flown in from uh, Australia. We quickly lost that airplane uh, due to a uh, engine issue. So I asked General Jumper to give me another one. He said, you know, we only had three. You've lost one. Uh, so, okay, I'll give you another one. In about a month, we lost that one uh, to a flight control issue. And he called me and said, are you going to ask for the third one? And I said, uh, no, sir. I, I I'll make do without it because I couldn't stand the, the peer pressure and the and the and the remorse of losing 100% of the Air Force's Global Hawk inventory. And he goes, "If you need it, you've got it." And I said, "Sir, I think we can do without it because of the, if the test uh, program plays out, we'll have more Global Hawks. Let's let's not deploy that one." So, Afcent lost two out of the three Global Hawks, but those things provided persistent coverage, both the Predators and the Global Hawk that we had never had before, even though the airframe itself was so limited. Like I mentioned, you could dash the Predator to 75 knots, uh, but if you had 100 knots uh, wind aloft, uh, you were hurting with that little airplane. So we lost a lot of them, uh, but it provided kind of a, a, a point-and-shoot capability that we didn't have before because you had to fly the big stuff all the way from bases in the Arabian Gulf or carriers. We were able to operate the Predators out of a couple of locations in theater that, that got us pretty close to being able to fly those things. The air-to-ground ordnance on them was limited. Hellfire missile doesn't have a very big warhead, but it's good enough you know, to go after a vehicle. The, the only thing uh, that I would 
re-mentioned that we've talked about is the ability to independently target from the chaos. After Maja Sharif, when a bunch of the Taliban folks were on the roads headed south, it's pretty easy to differentiate Taliban vehicles from normal farmers because the Taliban white Toyotas have twin barrel heavy uh, crew served weapons sticking out the back and a bunch of guys piled on. That's probably not people going to a Halloween party. So it would have been fairly easy to target these people, but we weren't given that authority. And when they, when they bottled up at night in villages uh, around mud huts and inside mud wall fences, it's pretty easy to, to differentiate who they are and who the normal civilians are, but we weren't given the authorities to be able to hit them. But the unmanned systems gave us that little bit of an edge uh, that we didn't have before. And we really learned some serious lessons on that and then fast forward into Operation Iraqi Freedom it was like a graduate course on using these things against the uh, five or six divisions of the Republican Guard. Uh, so I think the unmanned, I've always been a fan of them. It's just a matter of who tests them uh, and what authorities you have with them uh, and the, your ability to feed them into the overall ATO and the overall uh, air campaign. Chief, let me jump in here um, to, to just underline and maybe take some of this to a uh, to amplify what you said, um, uh, I remember when that first Global Hawk showed up. And to me, as a chaos director, it was like mana from heaven. Because what it gave us, and and you remember this, is a, and, and you mentioned it, I mean, they gave the chaos direct information on what was going on in the battle space that we couldn't get in a timely fashion from the... Uh, uh, <laughs> Byzantine bureaucracy and structure that delayed satellite communications. So we 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 could task these vehicles um, ourselves. Now at the same time, we had challenges. Um, I, I'm going to real quickly describe one mission that I'm sure Stutzel will remember, uh, and this was a Predator mission. I mean, we 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 received some intelligence that the uh, Taliban core commanders were going to have a meeting in northeastern Kabul. Uh, and we had a, a predator up that was actually observing the site, watching them arrive. But we didn't have SATCOM link directly on the, uh, on the, uh, 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 the predator. Uh, so as we're watching this unfold, um, there's an F-14D bombcat in the area. And we're trying to direct his eyes onto the target. So we're essentially doing a nine-line talk on uh, because we couldn't go directly through the Predator. So the, the transmission's going um, from the Kayak up to a satellite, down to the aircraft carrier, up to an E2D, over to an AWACS, then transmitted to uh, the, the, the Tomcat driver. And it went something like this. Okay. Do you see the traffic circle in northeast Afghanistan? Then there was a delay. Yeah. Okay. Go to the north exit. Uh, go up four blocks. Hang a left. Third house on the right. Now, uh, y y you know, what I just said, uh, it took about five minutes to go through the different response cycles. Um, but that's what we were limited and restricted to do because of some of the communications challenges. And there are many, many other stories where, you know, I'm talking AC-130's eyes onto a target uh, because we have the predator to feed in the chaos, but they didn't have it directly. And that's what birthed some of these, you know, the, the frictions that we had is what birthed some of these technological advantages where we're able to directly send the feed from the Predator into cockpits that later were developed. Remember that, Stutz? Yes. Yeah, I do. And I also recall that uh, both during your time there, uh, General Welch's time there, and uh, Mosley, there were so many innovations that occurred uh, because of the limitations we had, workarounds. And when you talk about combat cloud, when you talk about ABMS or JADC2 and the concepts underpinning them that was all being formulated under all your leadership in the workarounds that we had to do to make things happen 
you can you can just extrapolate that to today and see how much has changed based upon the learning on the fly in the combat operations back then. I really appreciate it. So let's just quickly go around the table. Knowing what you know now, especially with what we saw unfold in Afghanistan this summer, what do you think the country should be taking away from OEF and and subsequent operations in Afghanistan? Yeah, let me just uh, kind of make a personal comment up front here uh, before we go into that. And that's, um, first of all, I think uh, I have to personally thank John Mosley for what he did, not just in Afghanistan, but uh, follow on through Iraq, etc. That is a a hell of a job that sometimes goes unnoticed. <clears throat> Same thing goes for General Dev Tula and Stetsram. Great stuff. My comment would be um, everybody on this video generally understands uh, almost everything that's been said, uh, some better than others. But it, we, we make it sound kind of simple. But there's years and years and years of training and expertise built into this uh, group here, uh, particularly General Mosley. And we kind of take that for granted. One of the things that I took away uh, from the early part of uh, OEF was that uh, the, the, the central staff in CENTCOM was not prepared for this type of activity. They hadn't uh, thought about it. They hadn't been trained to it. Uh, there were, frankly, airmen in CENTCOM senior staff that didn't understand the capabilities the Air Force had at the time. The good fortune is we had people like Dave and Stutz in the early part and then General Mosley uh, in the early part as well that are doctorate level understanding of air power and the application of it. Going back to General Mosley's point about uh, UAVs, which I think was excellent. Um, we've, we've made that look fairly simple uh, because of people like uh, the three I just mentioned here. It's not. I mean, you have to have years and years of doctorate level understanding and uh, training and personal uh, creativity to understand how to benefit uh, these systems to the to the war fight. I think the lesson I take away from all of this is that uh, all people that are involved in military planning, and, and we could talk about Afghanistan uh, withdrawal ad finitum, but have a duty to understand all the systems that may be required and are available uh, to execute any kind of mission we're going to uh, operate under. And, and I think the loss is that the four or the three people here that we're talking with um, had trained themselves, disciplined themselves over time, had the experience and the ingenuity to actually make some of these activities look pretty simple. They're complex. Uh, and I think the lesson we need to take away from uh, beginning of Afghanistan all the way through the withdrawal of Afghanistan and to a certain extent, the activity in Iraq is that if you're not prepared, you've let down your nation. These three people were prepared and did a great job. Let me offer a, a couple of uh, thoughts and reinforce what General Wall just said. A lot of this the senior warfighting stuff is based on personal relationships. And you develop personal relationships over time with each other through familiarity or being in the same place at the same time, whether it's an airman to an airman or an airman to a sailor or an airman to a soldier or a Marine. Like I said, Joe Wald and I go back to when we were babies. So the transition between the two of us was seamless. Uh, dealing with Jim Mattis and dealing with the Marines, Jim Mattis, I've uh, been around him, Jim Amos, uh, Mike Hagee, Jim Conway. Those guys, uh, Joe Wald and I all grew up with those guys. Uh, David McKernan, uh, George Casey, uh, P.T. Miklicek, and the Navy guys, you know, Dave Nichols, uh, Tim Keating, all, all those guys from a million red flags and a million experiences and a million uh, staff assignments, senior human-to-human -human relationships in the joint community is truly based on relationships. It's based on trust. And I, I guarantee you, Eisenhower did it that way, Bradley did it that way, you know, Arnold did it that way. It, 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 Mitchell did it that way in World War One. And so those are things you don't learn at SOS and ACSC. Those are things you experience in the field. And so I think for our listeners, as we think about what does this mean in the future, every opportunity to operate jointly and coalition-wise, every opportunity to learn and experience together is money in the bank for an unknown tomorrow. I've got just a couple of three things. We talked about the tankers and about that's a city point failure. Another thing I would ask the listeners, there's been 
a bit of stray voltage uh, uh, as we discuss this Afghanistan closure on. We've been in combat 20 years. Actually, we've been in combat 30 years. The first fighter wing deployed in uh, late 1990 into the eastern province of Saudi Arabia for Desert Shield and then Desert Storm, and the American Air Force and elements of the Navy and Marines and Army Air Defense have never come home. So this is not a 20-year fight. This is a 30-year fight. And think how many Christmases and holidays and birthdays and soccer games and et cetera have been missed for 30 straight years. And think of the wear and tear on the airplanes uh, and the hardware for 30 straight years. So I, I would remind our listeners that this isn't a 20-year fight. This is a 30-year fight. Two other observations uh, real quick. Uh, I was very clear with the staff, and Stutz will remember this, I think, uh, very clear. I used to preach, we're not going to have uh, returning POWs out of a POW camp uh, in this game. If, if we put people on the ground, we're, we're going to have to go get them. There's going to be no POW camps. There's going to be no repatriated POWs. This is going to be a fight for life. Uh, and if we put a kid on the ground, we're going to go get him. And in this evolution, we, we did fly the longest combat search and rescue missions the Air Force has flown over distance which takes you then to the priority of combat search and rescue and what does it take in today's world to go do that. Uh, next thing is, uh, and I'll take a hit on this myself, was BDA. Uh, we got no BDA. We got no BDA from the national assets either in Afghanistan or in Iraq. We got no BDA from operational level, none. And so that takes us back to those UAVs and the Predators. We actually use those to get our own damn BDA. There were, at the time, three or four F-16 guard units that had sensor pods on them that would make them a whole lot like a recce bird. And I, uh, with discussions with the staff at CENCOM, told them, I need BDA. Uh, we're going to need to know what's going on here. And I was told, no, you'll get it. You'll get all the BDA you need. And so I chose not to deploy those units with those pods. Bad on me. Uh, I should have I should have trusted my gut and I should have trusted my instincts and deployed those those assets because the airman lives and breathes with BDA. You have to know what effect you're having given the task, uh, and so that takes you back to those those uh, UAVs and the Predators uh, and and the Global Hawks there, Doug, because we we fell back on those just out of necessity. So uh, to recap, we've been fighting 30 years. Tankers, single point failure. There's going to be no POW camps. Uh, and don't count on getting BDA from anybody. It's got to be indigenous. But that's, I, I don't want to sound uh, prickly or, uh, or in any way other than factual, but, man, that's got, that's got some scar tissue for me there on those topics. Yeah, let me jump in here. Uh, first, I... As Joe Mosley's talking, I'm thinking back to the uh, beginning of those 30 years, 31 years now, and it's just a bit frustrating because we didn't have any BDA during Desert Storm either. We had to initiate our own uh, method uh, for uh, figuring it out. You'd think we'd uh, uh, we'd figure this out by now, uh, and it, it's certainly an issue and uh, uh, continues to be one, so we need to put some brain power against that as we move into the future. Um, let me go back to answer your question in the context of um, what should the country take away from OEF. Uh, first, I want to make the point that, uh, so I'm not misunderstood, at a tactical level, the efforts of the military men and women who fought in Afghanistan were a success in every way. But the same was not the case when assessing U.S. operations in Afghanistan from a strategic perspective. The large-scale ground occupation efforts that marked the past two decades in Afghanistan were a failure of strategy. Now, at the same time, let's not confuse the termination of U.S. ground operations in Afghanistan with the end of U.S. involvement and influence there. Maintaining aerospace options can ensure security for both the United States and our partners in the region. The use of smart, precise, focused uh, air and space power to address core threats that continue to roil the region 
can provide the current administration and future administrations the opportunity to stop doing what had not been working, large-scale ground occupation, and continue doing what has been working to sustain America's interest. And that's the unique application of America's aerospace power options. So some takeaways I've got, uh, first of all, having served with uh, three great leaders uh, who are here with me today, uh, is that we're going to lose a fight with China if the defense enterprise suffocates its air and space power as it has done for the last couple of decades. Uh, we've got problems with resourcing. We've got problems with the speed of the enterprise. And that leads me to what I have learned from you in these operations. Um, the airmen are absolutely, as you said, General Deptula, inherently they, at the tactical level, innovative. And they, they, they figure it out despite the restrictions. Uh, and I, I recall when uh, Jim Poss, the head of the Intel cell, was trying to fuse information. Uh, if you recall, at the start of this operation, JSTARS, P3, uh, RC-135s, and other service assets, uh, they all had proprietary uh, outputs, and they were in different types of grids and different types of, of presentations. And they were worked in separate rooms. They had separate compartmented classifications. And Jim Poss uh, brought all that together around a table, and they actually wheeled their little uh, terminals. And in a short order, uh, the, the big security managers back in the States were threatening him with breach of, uh, of you know, security rules and classifications. And we had moved that down out to the uh, floor, operating floor of the CAOC had to put uh, drapes around it, and we were still getting complaints. So there's a lot of things today when we talk about overclassification, when we talk about stove piping, the bureaucracy of the Department of Defense and beyond is not prepared as it should be, uh, uh, having learned or not learned the lessons that we experienced back in Operation Enduring Freedom. Stutz, I got I to gotta interrupt here because – you remind me of uh, a story, uh, I was going to say hours. No, it was more like minutes before the opening of uh, uh, the, the, the first TOT. And, and General Wald will remember this one fondly. I sure do. Uh, and, that's, and, and, and that's the comm guys were giving him grief over the fact that he wanted the predator feed to be located uh, in the crow's nest in the middle of the chaos. Uh, and, y- you know, they're, they're telling General Wobble, you can't do that because the security level's not high enough. And I, <laughs> you remember that, General Wald? I mean, it was, it, it was incredible. It's like, hey, I'm kind of like the commander here, and I want the pred feed where I can use it. I don't want to have to go out of the building and walk down the street uh, but it just amplifies what you're talking about. I, I mean, who are we protecting the information from? We're the ones that are doing the targeting. Okay, back to you. Yeah, we had a lot of that. Um, the other, the other part I will say is, and this was more having worked for the into the next summer of 2002 with General Mosley and the three of you. I tell you, it shaped my career, the rest of my career that leadership was so important. And we're not talking about, uh, you know, organizational leadership. We're talking about combat leadership. I recall so many stories where, where you gents, uh, you had an, an air about you, which was don't wait, get it done, run, innovate, find the solution. We were never just sitting back waiting. We were aggressive And that was all shaped by the leadership that, you know, that that was there. And that was important that we were not in a lot of different spaces. We were not uh, balkanized, so to speak. Everybody knew who was driving this. And it was always inspiring. It was tough. uh, But but it really got things done against many pieces of the system, which just weren't supporting us as they should. Uh, And then finally, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this one vignette. Uh, this was later in uh, 
late spring, I think General Mosley, uh, we, a group of us went over to Bahrain uh, to do some work, uh, planning work. And uh, we went to the Sherlock Holmes. I don't know if you recall that famous bar there in Bahrain uh, or not remember it because there was a lot of, a lot of uh, R and R that went on there, but we, we were in this room and we, met up with some of the special operators that were on the ground in Afghanistan. And we knew them by call sign, but not by face or name. And uh, I just wanted to thank these guys for their courage and the kind of work they did and how we coordinated so well. And uh, before I could say a thing, one of the guys, uh, which we would recognize by call sign, uh, came up, he grabs me, gives me a big hug, tears in his eyes coming down his cheeks, uh, just so appreciative for what the airmen did in supporting their operations on the ground. It was truly uh, a magnificent tactical operation led by some great operational leadership, strategic leadership. And I just feel honored to have served with you guys. I really appreciate hearing that from all of you. So just to wrap this up, you know, the experience you all have is truly incredible and you're all hitting on, on elements here that are, are so important. But, you know, if we look at the present state of the Air Force, I mean, we've got the smallest, oldest aircraft fleet that we've ever had since since the founding of the service. The demands for air power are through the roof, and they're going to continue to surge even more. And, you know, you've had to answer the call to send young men and women into harm's way. And what's it going to take to ensure the next set of air commanders are, are postured to win? Just uh, make a real quick comment on that. Again, I go back to uh, preparation, understanding, and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate. I sat here thinking about it that people like uh, Jerome Mosley, particularly, or even uh, Dave and Stutz, don't have a voice beyond this uh, continuously. I mean, we've fallen into a trap of, we've said this a lot in the Air Force, and Jerome Mosley can speak volumes to this. Uh, we, we've, I think people have become. Um, comfortable and uh, take for granted the capability the Air Force brings to the fight, uh, air power. Obviously, we're, we're prejudiced about where we come from and what we believe in, but but what you're coming, what you're alluding to, Doug, is that fact is that air power uh, and the capabilities that are brought by air power are underappreciated, not from the standpoint we need to pat it back, but underappreciated from what strategic flexibility that brings to the United States uh, government and our military and um, there's always going to be a debate which is healthy about which systems are you know needed or important or more of uh, but I but I would say this I think uh, the Air Force has had a tendency to be somewhat humble over time because uh, we've, we've had this reputation of being uh, somewhat braggadocio I suppose which is uh, easy to be nurtured by people that don't necessarily uh, like the competition that the Air Force brings. But I think the most critical thing we can do right now as we go through this uh, strategic review over the, the globe right now is for a people like yourselves, General Mosley, uh, to continue to speak out on the, the uh, capabilities that Air Power brings to the international diplomacy and international uh, power that the United States needs to wield and I think it's underappreciated. That bothers me. And I think we need more voices like that. Let me pile on with what Joe Wall said. I think if we were in a, a seminar at National War College and we were talking about the National Command Authority and the relationships within the international community over uh, how to define and prosecute uh, national initiatives or national objectives or national interests, I think from the military's perspective, what you offer is a set of tools that you can persuade uh, a likely opponent or a community, or you dissuade frisky activity, or you deter, and if that fails, then you fight. The, the attributes of the equipage and the training, the organization, organize, train, and equip to fight happens to give you the tool set that you need to persuade, dissuade, and deter. If you are not able to do that, then you are at risk across uh, the entire spectrum of activities, economic, diplomatic, political, military, et cetera. Uh, China comes to mind. Russia comes to mind. Imagine, imagine if we were officials within the EU looking at a cold winter in Europe, knowing that we're near 100% dependent on Russian natural gas. 
uh, down a single pipeline to be able to keep our citizens uh, safe and from freezing to death. Boy, if that if that's not an incentive uh, uh, to get active, I don't know what is. So I think from 50,000 feet down, when you think about organizing, training, and equipping, that's a pretty good template under Title 10 of what a service has to do. The equipment has to be state-of-the-art, it has to be in sufficient numbers, and it has to be of a capability that allows you to fight and persevere, but also if you do it right, you never have to fight. I mean, as a chief, I don't know how many times I testified and said, if you give me the equipment, I guarantee you we'll be able to persuade, dissuade, deter, we won't have to fight. If you don't give me the equipment, it's a linear progression. If if you cripple the American military, we will have to fight. And then I would always be asked, do you think you're going to fight the Chinese or Russians? I said, no. It's, in fact, President Bush asked me that. I said, no, I think there's a low possibility or probability we're going to fight that unless civilians get us into something stupid. But there's a 100% chance we're going to fight their equipment because they sell it. And so if you go, go back in time to the policy decisions over Air Force equipage, organized, train, and equip, and look at what we've lost over 30 years, versus what we could have had, and you look at the Navy over losses of Arleigh Burke and Virginia-class boats, particularly the Air Force with numbers of F-35s, F-22, and a bomber that was supposed to have been ISC by 2018. Imagine what Sink Indo-Pacific could do with more Arleigh Burks, more Virginia-class boats, forward-deployed Raptors, Lightnings, tankers, and bombers. Now when you talk about China, now you can talk about persuading. You can talk about dissuading, but without those attributes, no. And I think the other part, Doug, you asked about how do we prepare for the future? I think as a chief, my notion was prepare uh, majors and lieutenant colonels to assume responsibilities that teach them to become colonels and teach them to become general officers. Squadron commander learns maintenance and learns ops, the group commander or wing commander. And as much as it irritated people, I used to say, look, I'm not in the business of promoting a bunch of support officers to general officer rank. I'm in the business of creating war fighting squadron group wing commanders and CFACs. I'm in the business of preparing airmen to employ through the air and space domain. And I'll tell you, it's the biggest resistance I got was internal. You know, it's almost the, uh, and, and Joe Wall will laugh at this, it's almost like collective anonymous insubordination. The chief says we're going to turn right. Well, he doesn't really mean that. He he doesn't really mean we're going to focus on actual combat. Are you kidding me? That gets into my programs. That gets into my timeline. So, Doug, it bears, I guess what I'm saying is it bears leadership that is willing to be focused on combat, not on Washington, uh, not on happy snaps uh, and hyperbole and not on talking points. You focus on combat. You focus on teaching squadron commanders to fight, to maintain airplanes, to generate sorties. You focus on group commanders and wing commanders, NAF commanders. You build CFACs. And when you build CFACs, you build war fighting level, operational strategic level thinkers. But you can't just, you don't get to pick where you're going to fight. Who knew that General Wall was going to deploy in in September to go to Afghanistan and fight? Where was that on a three by five card somewhere? You don't get to pick where you're going to fight. You have to be able to fight. So I, I'm going to get off my hot chair here, quit banging my spoon on my hot chair. But, Doug, I think that's how you focus. It's a building block. Moody Souter used to talk about this all the time. It's a building block. Basic building blocks lead to intermediate, lead to big. You go, you go small to big. You go to composite force training. You take risks in training. That was his, that was his template by creating red flag. You fight those fights in the Western desert so that you know how to fight. And if you if you don't do it that way, then every day is a pickup game. And, and in this war fighting business, the opponent gets to choose. Sometimes they choose wisely. So I don't know, Doug, if that answers your question. I'll quit banging my spoon. Okay, well, uh, uh, obviously I uh, wholeheartedly concur with uh, the remarks of both uh, General Wald and uh, General Mosley. Let me, let me add my perspective here in a concise fashion. What I'd tell you is that the Air Force is today uh, a geriatric force. 
and it must be recapitalized with relevant air and spacecraft that can deter conflict and, if necessary, win against pure threats in the future. Now, here's a little-known fact that I just recently uncovered that's pertinent to the discussion. Between FY 2002, in other words, the very beginning of Operation Enduring Freedom, and this year, 2021, the United States Army received over $1 trillion more than the Air Force. Let me let, let sink that in. $1 trillion more than the Air Force, or an average of about $55 billion a year more than the Air Force. I'd tell you that it's now time to reverse that allocation to modernize and grow the Air Force out of its current ranking of weak that was just released uh, a couple of days ago by in an assessment by the Heritage Foundation. Now, the current Air Force Chief of Staff established the slogan of, quote, Atel- accelerate change or lose, unquote. And the current Secretary of the Air Force has defined his top three priorities as China, China, and China. What I'd tell you is without a shift in DOD resources to the Department of the Air Force soon, what the Department of Defense risks is an accelerated chance of losing to China when they decide the time is right to challenge us militarily. So it's time to change the Air Force slogan or tagline from accelerate change or lose to increase the Air Force budget share or lose. Hey, Dave, let me uh, let me reinforce that. Yeah, I, I think the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians are, are in a way doing us a favor right now by being pretty upfront and being pretty visible as, as potential frisky operators. Uh, it's, it's pretty hard to ignore uh, hypersonic rounds, uh, fifth gen fighters, because we were told, if you remember, it'll be 25 or 30 years before the Russians or Chinese fly a low observable fighter. And of course, they flew it within months. I think this administration needs to take a really, really hard look at modernization and recapitalization, and it needs to streamline the department, and it needs to get down to things that produce hardware. In the case of the F-35, I think the joint program office is long overdue to go away and harvest that savings, give that program back to the Department of the Air Force, Department of the Navy. Those are just some examples. Why do we have 17 intel entities in the U.S. government sucking up personnel costs and money. There's so many things that can be looked at that reduce the footprint and be able to focus on recapitalization, modernization, and that combat preparation. But again, I'm banging my spoon on my hot chair. Well, I think you're going to enjoy our latest Mitchell Institute report on a uh, future fighter force structure plan that we'll be releasing next week. Uh, first of all, I can't thank Dave and Stutz enough for what they did. Uh, I've said that a million times, and I'll always say it. But, um, Chief, what you just articulated is is critical. And um, I'd like to see your voice be more public. So I'm making an appeal to you to be more public about that. But I appreciate what you've done. I think, uh, I think uh, you gents have dropped the mic on this discussion. I don't want to complicate or take away from it. I will say uh, that... Today's Air Force, our, our leaders need to look back and and really consider being more outspoken, just as you said, General. Well, they, they need to advocate. They need to be zealots. They need to take inspiration from Spots and Mitchell and Arnold and, and Mosley because uh, you were – everything you talked about in the early 2000s uh, and were defending as Chief uh, Staff of the Air Force – has all come true. Uh, and uh, and if the airmen are not out there, the, today's leadership group aggressively uh, promoting air power and space power and their needs and uh, really standing toe to toe with the other service advocates, they're failing. And they can start by, by really taking a look at PME, taking a look at the Air Force Academy, taking a look at a lot of things that are going on where we have 
uh, you know, organizations inviting, you know, folks like Dave Petraeus or Stan McChrystal to inspire our airmen. Uh, and that's a pretty dubious uh, undertaking, I would say. We need to get our war fighters who have been successful, our, our, our former uh, uh, generals who, who, who understand this, who've been successful in combat, who can speak more openly being outside the active ranks, the Air Force really needs to look inward and, and, and harken back and be more aggressive in, uh, in what they are responsible for. Well, gentlemen, I, I can't thank you enough. It's been an incredible conversation, and it's been an honor. So, again, thank you very much. I'd like to extend a big thank you for our guests for joining in today's discussion. And I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning into today's show. And if you liked what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow and subscribe the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment and let us know what you think about our show or areas that you think we should explore further. And as always, you can join in the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. So thanks again for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.